in Surah 18, chapter 18, the cave, Al-Kahf, verse 94 to 100. They said, O Dhul Qurnayn, Ya'juj and Ma'juj are workers of corruption in the land, so may we point for thee payment that thou make between us and them a barrier. He said, That wherein my Lord has established me is better, but assist me with strength. I will make between you and them a dam. Give me sheets of iron. When he had made level between the two openings, he said, Blow. When he had made it a fire, he said, Bring me to pour thereon molten brass. And they could not pass over it, and they could not pierce it. He said, This is a mercy from my Lord, but when the promise of my Lord comes to pass, he will make it level, and the promise of my Lord is true. And we will leave them that day to surge one upon another, and the trumpet will be blown, and we will gather them together, and lay hell bare that day to the false claimers of guidance. Breaking this down, in verse 94, Dhul Qarnayn, or Dhul Qarnayn, is an interesting character. Now, it is widely believed by most modern Muslim scholars that Dhul Qurnayn was actually Alexander the Great. Dhul Qurnayn in Arabic translates to the one with two horns or the one with twinned horns. Now Alexander the Great was also depicted with the horns of Ammon on his head and we have historical references of this. So one can say that there is some weight to the theory that this was actually Alexander the Great. The issue I have is with the moment that we have a vague description of someone with two horns one can go into the deity Jupiter Ammon, also depicted as Zeus with two horns. And this also goes back to the ancient Egyptian goddess of Hathor and Isis, also having these twinned horns on their heads. We also get this theme running through the Celtic traditions and the Celtic history. In the Gundestrup cauldron, uh, the Celtic horn god Canunus uh, was also depicted with two stag horns coming out from his head whilst holding the serpent. This I find quite interesting as a description because this theme is quite common amongst the ancient past and the history of the peoples throughout Europe. On to verse 95, it states, That wherein my Lord has established me is better, but assist me with strength, I will make between you and them a dam. And he asks for sheets of iron to be given to him, so that he can put molten brass in the two openings so that these people of Gog and Magog or Yetjurj and Metjurj cannot pass through to cause corruption in the land. Now here's something of note. In the Arabic and in the Hebrew language, Aramaic also, the letter J or J as it's pronounced in the Western tongue, is non-existent in the alphabet or in the alphabets of those ancient languages. Hence why when we look at the word Gog and Magog or Gog Magog, which I'll be going into in a bit, is actually the wrong pronunciation. 
is actually George and May George. Going into the relevance of Gog and Magog, there is the religion side of it and there is the mythological side of it. In the Christian scriptures in the New Testament, they are referred to as the evil forces opposed to the people of God. There's not many references in the Bible, but they have an important place in the apocalyptic literature and also in the medieval legends. In books of the Chronicles 5.4, Gog is identified as a descendant of the prophet Joel and in Ezekiel 38 to 39, he is the chief prince of the tribes of Meshech and Tubal in the land of Magog, or Majoj, who is called upon by God to conquer the land of Israel. And with a great coalition of forces from throughout the realm, the world, Gog and his army will invade Israel, like a cloud covering the earth, and will plunder and loot the cities. And God will then send a terrible natural disaster that will destroy Gog and his forces. The defeat of Gog will demonstrate the greatness and holiness of God and restore good relations between God and his people. Now, having discussed this recently with Jason, he refers to Gog or the people of Gog and Magog as the Muslims or as the Arab Muslims who will invade Israel. It is obviously heading that way and it has been for a while since 1948 since the occupation of Palestine. We also have in the revelation to John 27 to 10 the names Gog and Magog are applied to the evil forces that will join with Satan in the great struggle at the end of time. And after Satan has been bound and chained for a thousand years he will be released and will rise up against God. He will go forth and deceive the nations of the world. Gog and Magog gathering them together in great numbers to attack the saints and Jerusalem, the city God loves. God will send fire from heaven to destroy them and will then preside over the last judgment. These biblical passages concerning Gog and Magog, later on there were attempts to associate them with specific individuals and places and Gog has been identified by modern scholars with Gyges or Gigas a 7th century BC king of Lydia and with the Akkadian god Gaga. Now you know where you get the name Lady Gaga from. And it has also been argued that the name Magog is derived from an Akkadian word meaning the land of Gyges or Giges. In the 1st century the Jewish historian Josephus claimed that Gog and Magog were the Scythians and in the 5th and 6th centuries they were held also to be the Huns. Now there are many 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 different associations to do with Gog and Magog. They were also equated with the Magyars in the 10th century and with the entire Muslim world led by Muhammad and Salahuddin Saladin in the Middle Ages. In both Jewish and Christian apocalyptic writings, they were also identified with the ten lost tribes of Israel. Going back to Alexander the Great, these legends were associated with Magog and Magog, and they were to do with Alexander's Gate, said to have been built by Alexander the Great to imprison these uncivilized and barbaric people until the end of time. In medieval legends of Antichrist and the Last Emperor, Gog and Magog were allied with the armies of Satan and in various prophetic texts, Gog and Magog took part in the persecutions led by the Antichrist and preceded Antichrist as a sign of his coming or emerged following the defeat of the Antichrist in the struggle prior to the Last Judgment. The problem is with these corpuses, these holy books, whether it's the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, the Old Testament, we have to remember that these were written after the fact. We are told that these holy 
figures come into play and then 200 or so years later the texts and the books are written. We have no evidence or any sound evidence to see that any of these books were written at the time. These prophets or these messengers or these warners came. This tells me is that these teachings were taken and then later modified to the advantage of those people who wish to control the masses and the populations through institutionalized religions. One has to think clearly to see that there is some sort of manipulation in the narratives because it comes back to narratives and narratives are powerful as you can see today the news is filled with fictional narratives all lies spun into truths there is an independent legend of Gog and Magog which surrounds two giant wooden effigies in the Guild Hall of London they are thought to represent two giants who were taken to London to serve as guardians or porters at the gate of the royal palace after their race was destroyed by Brutus the Trojan, the legendary founder of London. Effigies of Gog and Magog have existed in London from the time of Henry V who reigned between 1413 and 1422. The first figures were destroyed in the Great Fire in 1666 and then they were replaced in 1708. The second pair was destroyed in a German air raid in 1940 and again replaced in 1953. Also in the legends recounted by the medieval English historian Geoffrey of Monmouth, Gog Magog or Goer Magot was a giant chieftain of Cornwall who was slain by Brutus's companion Corinius. This lays out the various traditions and mythologies in both religion and mythical contexts. Going back to Surah 18, the cave, and we will leave them that day to surge one upon another and the trumpet will be blown and we will gather them together and lay hell bare that day to the false claimers of ignorance. So these tribes known as Gog and Magog or Yetjuj and Metjuj are the false claimers of guidance. Who do we see today as the false claimers of guidance? And one has to wonder about this prophecy in the Quran that when it comes to pass he will make it level so that they will come out upon the earth again. To become workers of corruption in the land. Now I can theorize based on this data and the various data from Archaics and the work of Michael Tessarian on the black nobility and or what is commonly referred to as the elite. One has to say that Gog and Magog could be these very people because even if you refer to the Muslim world as Gog and Magog who will be manipulating the events so that these wars will happen in the first place and when we talk about institutionalized religion and brainwashing who is moving all these pieces on the chessboard for these wars to happen they are playing their part it is a script as we know and these prophecies are here to be fulfilled in the collective. In Surah 39, the throng, Al Zumar, verses 68 to 70. And the trumpet will be blown, and whoso is in the heavens and whoso is in the earth will fall down, thunderstruck, save whom God wills. Then will it be blown again and then will they be standing, looking on. And the earth will shine with the light of its Lord, and the book will be set up, and the prophets and the witnesses will be brought, and it will be concluded between them with justice, 
and they will not be wronged. And every soul will be paid in full for what it did, and he best knows what they do. So in verse 68, the trumpet will be blown. Whoso in the heavens and in the earth will fall down thunderstruck. This word thunderstruck in Arabic has two different meanings within the context of this verse. Thunderstruck obviously means someone who is struck, speechless to the realization they will come to when the trumpet is blown. The other translation to this word is lightning. They will be struck by lightning. Then it will be blown again and then will they be standing looking on. And there seems to be this sort of striking down and a raising up again. Again insinuating a reset event or possibly reincarnation or resurrection. And the earth will shine with the light of its Lord and the book will be set up. The book, the people of the book, the book. There is another translation where El Kitab, which means the book, can also mean the writ. Because Muslims believe that this book is like a writ of all the sins of the soul uh, that it's committed of every individual soul in this realm. And that there is this record by the left angel and the right angel. Again, it's how you interpret that as well. The angel on the right and the angel of the left. It's more to do with the right brain, left brain, lower consciousness, higher consciousness. Now the trumpet being blown, one can take it one of two ways. There is a literal trumpet that is blown in the heavens, in the sky, in, in this realm. And that we are all going to be hearing it, witnessing it happen. But there is also other verses where those errants or those who are aware of the end times and what is coming, they will not be harmed for a gentle wind will take them away. Surah 69, the reality, Al-Haqa, verses 13 to 18. And when the trumpet shall sound one blast, and the earth with the mountains shall be lifted up and crushed with one crash, then on that day will the event befall, and the heaven will split asunder, for that day it will be frail. And the angels will be on the sides thereof, and eight will uphold the throne of thy Lord that day above them. On that day ye will be exposed not a secret of you will be hidden. So there is this trumpet that shall sound one blast and that it will crush all the mountains and the earth in one crash. And that will bring about the event. It will befall everyone. And the heaven will be split asunder. So we'll be seeing the splitting of the sky, and that day will be frail. There will be some sort of splitting happening that day. And this alludes again to the 2040 and 2046 events where we will be seeing an atmospheric change, perhaps. And this is why the splitting of the heavens is one of those things. The water vapor canopy, possibly because there is a splitting there of the waters. And the angels will be on the sides thereof, and eight will uphold the throne of thy Lord that day above them. I've highlighted the word eight, and the reason being is I don't know if most of you remember the 1752 Norway event. I sent Jason the source from La Gazette, which was published on the 10th of June 1752. And it talks about uh, the octagonal shaped object throwing out fire 
in Stavanger in Norway on the 18th of April 1752, causing mass floods and violent earthquakes with fire coming out of this octagonal object witnessed by people at the time. Octagonal is obviously an eight-sided object. So it's very interesting to see that the throne of thy Lord has eight that will uphold the throne above them. On that day you will be exposed, not a secret of you will be hidden. This word exposure, meaning those who hide, and we are talking about the collective slash the elite, who will be hiding in their dumbs, the deep underground bunkers, they will all be exposed to this, according to the Quran, of course. Coming to the final verses here that I felt were relevant to this presentation with the word trumpet. Surah 50, Qaf, or the letter Qaf, verses 15 to 21. Were we then wearied by the first creation? Yet they are in doubt about a new creation. And we have created man, and we know what his soul whispers within him. And we are nearer to him than the jugular vein. When the two recorders record sitting on the right and on the left, he utters not a word save with him is a watcher ready. And the intoxication of death will bring the truth. That is what thou wast avoiding. And the trumpet will be blown, that is the day of warning. And every soul will come, with it a driver and a witness. Verse 15, one can interpret and see this. There is a first creation and a new creation, meaning that there has been resets since the first creation. It says here also, which is very interesting, we know what his soul whispers within him, and we are nearer to him than the jugular vein. Now one can take that as a way of looking that our souls are all sparks of the oversoul, of the divine, and we are all part of the mind of God. If you have any different interpretations to that, please leave a comment below. It would be interesting to share these ideas. In verse 17, it continues, When the two recorders record sitting on the right and on the left, he utters not a word save with him is a watcher ready. Now, I don't know about you, but when I meditate, or when I have gone through shamanic journeys, one sees that there is a witness to the ego that is Ahmed. There is a witness to this self-image of me. That to me is the soul, that to me is the oversoul, because I truly believe that God is within and there is always direct access to the oversoul. But there needs to be a relationship established there first to know it's there. And that takes meditation, that takes time, that takes a lot of self-development and work on our consciousness and cleansing the doors of perception. And the intoxication of death will bring the truth, that is, what thou wast avoiding. Meaning, to those who are avoiding the work that they needed to do in themselves, so that they may elevate their consciousness to what one calls the Christ, the consciousness of Christ, or the consciousness of God, or the Oversoul. Whatever label you want to use, it's up to you, the source. There are many labels to the nameless one. And the trumpet will be blown, that is the day of warning, and every soul will come with it a driver and a witness. Again, this trumpet being blown as a warning, and every soul will come with it a driver and a witness. There is different ways to interpret the driver and 
a witness in this verse, in this last verse. In our consciousness, we have our drives, our lower drives, which is our, let's say, lower basic instinct drives or animal desires. And there is a witness to that because there is a higher state of consciousness. Now, I don't want to go too much into the chakras, but the animal consciousness in Eastern and Buddhist philosophies are the lower chakras. The consciousness is in the lower chakras, thinking about the belly, thinking about the appetites, thinking about uh, the sexual drives and the satiation of those. Where when one elevates above in the higher states of the chakras, one is able to witness oneself. And that awareness cleanses and purifies the soul. And that awareness cleanses and purifies the spirit. Spirit is a form of energy. It's life itself. Again, this is my personal interpretation. And one can have their own spiritual values or the way they look at this simulation or simulacrum we're living in. Now for the surprise. This is a drawing from the apocalypse of Saint John de Lorval, the angel blowing the trumpet, the seven stars and the eagle of Saint John. Now, the question here, is it a phoenix? I'll leave that for you to interpret and to think about. Till next time, thank you for listening and watching.